I'm Dr. Noor Khatib, an emergency physician in the Toronto area, and today I am joined by Dr. Hashem Khan for the October 2021 Common Lung Conditions Community Health Series episode. So we're very happy to have you here with us today, and I'd love to get started to chat with Dr. Hashem Khan about common lung conditions and uh, just kind of understanding them a little bit more. You know, we read in the we read it in the media, we hear the words asthma, COPD, we hear smoking's bad, but I think you're going to hear you're going to learn a lot from Dr. Khan today. So Dr. Khan is a, a respirologist in the greater Toronto area, and we are extremely lucky to have him with us today to help us go through some of these conditions. Uh, like when I when you hear a uh, lung condition or common lung conditions, I'm sure you hear the word asthma a lot or you think of the word asthma a lot. Maybe uh, Dr. Khan can start off and talk to us about that. Thanks for joining us though. Thank you so much for having me, uh, Dr. Khatib, uh, on, on your show today. Um, so yeah, let's talk about asthma. Asthma is actually the most common lung condition uh, that we diagnose. There's uh, over 400 million people around the world who have asthma. Um, and one in 10 Canadians, so more than 3 million Canadians have asthma. So it's an extremely common condition. And the main uh, issue in asthma is that you're breathing tubes. So when you breathe in, the air around you goes into your lungs. And if your lungs are like balloons, it goes in via all these different air passages and breathing tubes. And if the breathing tubes are nicely normally open like this, uh, in asthma, what happens is the breathing tubes become a little bit more narrow and the walls become more thicker. And when that happens, then patients can have episodes of difficulty breathing, chest heaviness, uh, congestion, maybe even some discomfort or wheezing. And these, these uh, symptoms can go up and down during the day or during the year or even one's lifetime. And so we use different um, medications to try and help um, treat those symptoms, but also prevent things like asthma attacks from happening. So when, when you say asthma attacks, like what kind of medications help? So good question. So any patient who has asthma can have an asthma attack. Uh, we call that a flare up or an exacerbation. And uh, many, many years ago, many uh, patients just would use something called a blue inhaler or a blue puffer mm -hmm. uh, that you might have heard of like Ventolin or Salbutamol. You might have someone who carries it around. And that medication, all it does is it sort of opens up your breathing passages for a short period of time. But our research over years and years has shown us that because the problem in asthma is actually inflammation of the airways, the main inhaler that you need is one that actually has a low dose inhaled steroid in it. Because what that steroid does is it actually reduces the inflammation, which is causing all the problem. So the Ventolin can be like a Band-Aid treatment or it can be something that rescues you and helps mm -hmm. you with your symptoms, but it doesn't solve the underlying problem. The main medications that we use are inhalers and they have low dose steroids that are mostly within the lungs uh, and the mm -hmm. airways and they help reduce the inflammation so that patients don't have symptoms and they don't have a full blown asthma attack that can uh, require you to have some you know, oral steroids to help rescue your breathing or even mm -hmm. uh, land you in the emergency department or in the hospital. So because of this finding and because of what we've realized, less and less patients are now dying from uh, asthma and less mm -hmm. and less patients are actually even being hospitalized now with asthma as well. But in the developing world, so many other parts of the world, not here in Canada, they don't readily have access to such medications. So there are lots of people who still die every year from asthma, unfortunately. So you're talking to me about these steroids, and I know that young kids get asthma. So my main question to you is that, is that safe for, for kids to have these steroids over a long term? Are they taking them every day? What kind of, um, what would you say to a concerned parent that asks you about uh, inhaled steroids? That's a very good question. And, you know, I have this conversation on a daily basis with patients and, and parents and children as well. Um, the concern about steroids is, is, is obviously real. And it's because we, you know, we all think about steroids and the effect it can have on our body. What I tell them is, you know, the dose that we're using as an inhaled steroid, an inhaler is much lower than the one that you get when you are um, uh, inhaling it. Uh, and uh, or as opposed to when you're taking it as a tablet or when you go to the hospital. And so taking a little bit amount of the steroid every day, which mostly stays within your breathing tubes and which mo mostly stays within uh, your um, uh, within your lungs uh, is, is much better uh, because it doesn't go into your whole body. Uh, it doesn't um, uh, get absorbed through your gut uh, and it doesn't 
um, uh, uh, go to cause side effects elsewhere in your body. Whereas the inhalers, most of the medication is working within your lungs and your breathing tubes. So very little of it, if any, is, is absorbed within your bloodstream. So less chances of side effects. They're very well tolerated. And we have patients who've been using these inhalers for 20, 30, 40 years um, mm -hmm. without having significant issues. The other thing is, you know, when we're doing our jobs, uh, uh, you know, as lung doctors, our job is always to try and find the right balance between benefits and risk as we do in everything in medicine. So yes, we can give everyone the highest dose of medication all the time and treat uh, things, but that's not always the best balance of benefit and risk. So what we're always doing is we're always constantly reevaluating how you're doing, what your symptoms are like, what your risk is like of having an asthma attack, and we always try to find the lowest dose of the medication possible to keep your asthma under control. If you're doing really well, we'll try and reduce the dose. Mm -hmm. And if your asthma symptoms are not under control, then we'll go up on the inhalers as well. And so that's why that constant reevaluation with your family doctor or your lung doctor is actually quite important uh, to always get that balance right and the balance of benefit and risk. Okay, that's great. That makes perfect sense. Um, I, I mean, I hear this a lot, but some people tell me, Oh no, this kid's too young to have asthma. Are we look? Is there a specific age that people get asthma or get labeled as having asthma? Can you can you describe that to us or explain a little bit more about that? Can it can a uh, three month old that comes to me in the emerge and the, and the parents are saying, yeah, our kid has asthma. Is this true or what's uh, what's the uh, physiology there? Yes, for sure. So you know, before if you asked us twenty years ago, we would say that. Um, you know, there's perhaps, you know, one main kind of asthma uh, and we all treat it the same and we would lump everyone in the same bucket of having asthma. And now we're realizing that there's many different kinds of asthma. The classic asthma is what many of us may know is when children get diagnosed at a much younger age uh, and, you know, patients may have other conditions like eczema on the skin or seasonal mm -hmm. allergies like hay fever. Mm -hmm. And typically when you're a young uh, child, um, you know, uh, three, four, five, six, seven years old is when we start diagnosing children sometimes for the first time. You know, they might have a strong family history and, you know, they will have some of those symptoms that I described. Uh, they might have some trouble running around in school, keeping up with other kids in the playground. They might say that they're having trouble breathing or stopping. And, you know, based on that history is when we sort of try, uh, it's hard to do breathing tests on little children because they can't mm -hmm. do it. So sometimes based on the story, and based on what it sounds like, we'll give them a clinical diagnosis um, of asthma, especially if you know, we think it's asthma, we give you the medications and treatment for asthma and you get better, then you know, by and large, we'll say that's a pretty good um, uh, rationale and that's pretty good uh, of, an, of an explanation to say that you have asthma until you grow up and it's easier for you to do the breathing tests. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, when, so we will diagnose children when they're younger uh, and it's quite common for young boys more so than girls to be diagnosed and then especially when you go into your teenage years and, and adolescence is when most people will start getting diagnosed as well uh, with asthma. So when you're younger and you're, you're um, you know, a child or a teenager, it's more so men and boys that get diagnosed more um, than girls and women. And then when you actually go into your 30s, 40s, 50s and 60s, we actually diagnose more women and then men. And that's a different type of asthma. You know, there's, there's mm. patients who we'll see and diagnose when they're 50 years old. And they'll say, how is that even possible? I never had asthma as a child. Um, I, I, you know, I never had any problems. And that's because now we're recognizing that there's some people who don't get diagnosed as a child. They may not have the classic asthma, allergic type of asthma that we're talking about. They might have adult onset asthma, asthma that's diagnosed when you're a little bit older. Uh, you know, there's other conditions that are associated with asthma um, uh, as well. And, and they can certainly go hand in hand. And so depending on the different kind of asthma, you know, we would perhaps uh, make some certain changes to um, some of the medications that we give you. And that's certainly an evolving field right now. And is that, um, so it, I, what do you think about that being linked to pollution or being linked to living in a, in a big city? Uh, is there some kind of link to that, especially in those patients that are, that are getting diagnosed at a much older age? Yeah, it's a very good question, you know, so uh, there certainly is a correlation between air pollution levels and asthma control. And we do see patients who have worsening asthma type symptoms uh, when they are exposed to uh, pollutants in the air. So uh, whether it's dust, whether it's, you know, dander from pets at home or whether it's uh, particles from smoke or the environment around you has a big impact in individuals who are, 
more at risk of having asthma and having asthma attack symptoms and flare-ups. So we see, you know, patients from China or patients from India, for example, where there's much higher levels of pollution that they will have worsening asthma symptoms. Mm -hmm. And same thing over here, you know, in Canada, you know, we're sort of blessed with having some clean air compared to many other parts of the world, but people who come from outside the big cities. So if I, if I work in Toronto, when patients come from outside and they come into uh, Toronto, they'll actually feel it. And many yeah. of my patients will jokingly say, you know, doctor, my, my asthma symptoms is great uh, and, and they're really well under control when I go to the beach, uh, as opposed to when I'm over here. And I'll say, well, if I yeah. could give you a for going to the beach, I would give it to everyone. Um, but, mm -hmm. um, you know, so there certainly is a, a, a correlation between the air quality and uh, asthma symptoms and asthma control. And we can certainly see this, you know, as we talk about climate change and more, you know, uh, wildfires across Canada and across the mm -hmm. world. That certainly does have an impact uh, on uh, inflammation in the airways and asthma type symptoms. We need a beach inhaler of some sort. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, all right. So moving on to another kind of uh, lung disease, if we're going to start talking about patients who maybe have what, what we hear of as COPD. Now, oftentimes people don't know what COPD is unless they have it or they have a loved one who has it. But can you explain to us, number one, what does it stand for? What it is? Who gets it? How can I avoid it? Yes, most definitely. So uh, COPD uh, is, stands for a chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Uh, so chronic means that it's there for a long time and it will stay there for a long time. Obstructive meaning that there's narrowing. So the same breathing tubes that take air from uh, the air around you into your lungs, those same breathing tubes are now obstructed. So they're narrowed like this, and that's more mm -hmm. chronic and permanent. Pulmonary meaning the lungs and disease meaning it's a disease. Many years ago, we actually used to talk about different conditions like chronic bronchitis, which you might've heard of my family members who've been diagnosed with chronic bronchitis. And these are patients who typically would have lots of bouts of coughing and bringing up some phlegm and periods where they're coughing up more and, 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 and having more difficulty breathing and bringing up some phlegm. There's another condition called emphysema, which you might've heard of, uh, where those patients, they basically uh, have more difficulty breathing when they're exerting themselves and they can't catch their breath. They're not so much coughing up uh, so much or bringing up so much phlegm. And both of these conditions, the most common cause, you know, more than 80 to 90% of patients who have this condition, it's actually related to uh, smoking. Uh, so tobacco smoking, cigarette smoking is strongly, strongly linked to the number one cause of uh, COPD uh, and both of these conditions. And we've basically taken chronic bronchitis and emphysema and we've put it all together into saying patients mm -hmm. have this label of diagnosis called COPD. What that means is, uh, you know, these patients, you know, from years and years of exposure, uh, mostly from smoking, their breathing tubes become narrowed and they're permanently narrowed. Mm -hmm. And so you can have difficulty breathing. Uh, you can have periods where you have a flare up, just like in asthma, mm -hmm. where you might have worsening breathing, coughing up more, bringing up some phlegm, and many things can cause it. Uh, typically, infections, bacterial or viral, can push you over the edge. And those uh, symptoms can be quite significant to the point that if you can't catch your breath, it lands you in the emergency department or it lands in the hospital or in the intensive care unit, and many patients can die from it. So most patients is related to cigarette smoking. Now, if someone's a non-smoker, then we think a little bit harder as to why. And mm -hmm. so at least in the developing world, one of the most common reasons why if it's not cigarette smoking, it's, you know, especially if they're women, it can be if you're exposed to what we call biomass fuel or smoke from cooking, cooking over open flames and fires. And that can cause the smoke itself can cause changes to the breathing tubes and narrowing of the breathing tubes and the changes consistent with COPD. And a very small percentage, roughly 5% of patients can actually have a genetic reason why. They have mm -hmm. a genetic deficiency that predisposes them even if they've never smoked or been exposed to large amounts of smoke that causes them to have COPD and changes as if they were a smoker, but they've never smoked. So those are the main reasons why mm -hmm. patients would get COPD. Okay. That's, that's quite comprehensive. Thanks for that. Um, I actually, I, I, this brings me to think about a patient that I had in the ICU a couple of weeks back. Uh, I was working an ICU shift and she was in fact a end stage COPD patient who uh, basically was not going to recover and was palliative. 
So can you talk to us a little bit about whether this is reversible, whether uh, quitting smoking would have helped? What what can patients do if they, you know, we make we all make mistakes. Maybe someone smoked for 20 years and is now hearing about all sorts of t- terrible lung diseases and wants to quit. What c- How can we encourage them to quit? And is this reversible? How How can we help them? Uh, great. Thank you, Dr. Khatib. So as I mentioned, you know, the number one cause of COPD is uh, smoking. Uh, so, um, and it's actually the second most common condition after asthma that I treat as a lung doctor. So asthma, you know, there might be a genetic reason for it, and it's very common, and there's environmental reasons as well. And second after that is COPD. And if most of the causes of, of uh, COPD are related to tobacco smoking or cigarette smoking, then the number one thing that you can do for your health is quitting smoking. And that's a long conversation that I have with all my patients. You know, believe me, I have many patients who get who come to me when they've been smoking for 20, 30, 40 years, and they've got significantly advanced lung disease where maybe their lung function is now 20%, 30% than what it should be from anyone else compared to their age. And many of them have mm-hmm. regrets, you know, they tell, they, and, and that's not necessarily their fault. You know, smoking was very common you know, and it still is, but it it was seen as something somewhat normal 30, 40 years ago. And it's very addictive as well. And so it's hard for people to quit as well. Now we know a lot more. People will say, you know, before doctors used to smoke as well, but now, you know, many don't because we know about what's, you know, how they're bad for your lungs. So the two things that have actually been shown to make you live longer when it comes to COPD are one, quitting smoking. Okay, Mm -hmm. the inhalers and other medications don't make you live longer, but quitting smoking certainly makes you live longer. Great. It slows down how quickly your lung function goes down compared to if you continue smoking, your lungs will go down much faster than anyone else who's mm-hmm. healthy and who's not smoking. And the second thing that helps you live longer is actually oxygen if you need it. So not everyone with COPD needs oxygen or gets oxygen. But if you are someone whose oxygen levels are quite low because you've damaged your lungs so much, getting the oxygen um, can actually help you live longer as well. So quitting smoking and um uh, oxygen have been shown to make you live longer. At the same time, we give patients the inhalers, very similar to um, the inhalers that we use in patients who have uh, asthma as well, to you know both open up your lungs as well as reduce inflammation as well. Yeah. And the purpose of those inhalers and taking them every day, just like you would take a medicine for blood pressure, even if you don't feel your blood pressure, you take it. Why? Because you don't want to have a heart attack. Why? Because you don't want to have stroke. Same thing with medications for cholesterol. You don't always feel you have cholesterol, but your doctor tells you to take a medicine because you don't want to have a heart attack. You don't want to have a stroke. Same thing with asthma and COPD. We tell patients, think of it the same way where you're taking an inhaler every single day, even if you feel okay or if it's not too bad because you want to prevent bad things from happening. You either don't want your symptoms to get worse or you don't want to have a flare up that lands in the hospital and where you could you know, be in the intensive care unit. And, and there are, besides inhalers, we use um, things like pulmonary rehab, trying to make sure that everyone has uh, a balanced diet, is exercising and, and um, keeping all of their muscles uh, strong, whether it's in their arms and their legs, because that's very closely related to how strong their breathing muscles are as well. Mm-hmm. So there are programs available um, through hospitals and in the community that can help you stay active. So maintaining mm-hmm. a healthy weight and, and, and having a balanced diet and, and, uh, and exercise and all that good stuff that you hear about, it actually yeah. pays dividends in, in in terms of all your general health. Gotcha. So what I'm hearing is quitting smoking is the number one way to avoid these diseases and even uh, stop them from progressing if you do have them. So really, if if you're listening to us and you're a smoker, if you or if you have a loved one who's a smoker, there are ways to quit smoking. There are easier ways to quit smoking than you think. Um, speaking to your family doctor about certain medications that can help. Uh, support groups that can help. There's lots of ways you can quit smoking. And trust me, there are people, and I'm sure Dr. Khan can uh, can uh, can give you examples, people who've been smoking for 40 years who have been able to quit smoking. Um, so it is possible. And, and um, you know, everybody has a bit of willpower, but really you need the support. You need the support of your family doctor, the support of a support group. And the day you do it, you'll breathe better, you'll feel better, and your wallet will be thicker. So, uh, so just consider those things. And that's some great information for me. um, And for our, uh, for our listeners as well. So one uh, medical condition that I'd love for you to, to explain to us more about 
is, uh, and, and, you know, we hear about it a lot, but do we really understand what it is? Uh, is it just snoring or is it something more? Uh, sleep apnea. Can you kind of define sleep apnea for us? Uh, tell us how can we avoid becoming sleep apneic and, and how it may uh, affect our health if, we're, if we have sleep apnea? And really, is it just snoring or is it more? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, so sleep apnea, um, so sleep implies it's related to sleep and apnea meaning that you stop breathing. Um, it's a condition where um, the way I explain to patients is normally when we're sleeping, uh, our whole body relaxes. All the muscles in our body relax, our arms and legs because we're going to go to sleep. Same with the muscles that are around our neck over here. And mm -hmm. what happens in sleep apnea is, is that when everyone's sleeping, it's normal for your muscles to relax a little bit and for you to breathe normally. In patients who have sleep apnea, the muscles around here relax a bit too much and the breathing tubes up over here, they collapse a bit too much. So instead of being nice and open like this, they collapse a bit too much. When they collapse a bit too much, it's harder for air to go in and out through that narrow breathing tube. And that's when you start hearing sounds like snoring. So not everyone who has snoring has sleep apnea, but it is the most common symptom. You can get snoring also if, you know, if your nose is blocked or your nose is congested. So that's one of the things that we look out for. But it's very common for patients who have sleep apnea. We're recognizing it more and more over the years. It is generally associated with a number of different risk factors. So if you're a little bit older, uh, you're more likely to have sleep mm -hmm. apnea, although kids can get sleep apnea as well. If you are male versus female, so men, generally speaking, have more sleep apnea than, than women. Um, if you're overweight, so especially if your BMI or body mass index is over 30, or if your neck is a bit enlarged, you can imagine how the extra weight can actually make it easier for your breathing tube to collapse a little bit more than usual. Mm -hmm. um, and so these are the different uh, risk factors that patients can have to have to develop sleep apnea. And many people just say it's just snoring. Snoring is normal. And the reason why it's important to diagnose um, is because this condition has been linked with many other conditions. So if you have sleep apnea, it can make it harder for you to control your blood pressure. It can make it... Um, it, it can increase the risk of you having heart conditions like irregular heart rhythms, like atrial fibrillation. It can increase the risk of you having heart attacks and strokes. What happens is because your breathing is a little bit narrowed, your breathing sort of slows down. And when your breathing slows down, sometimes in a sleep apnea, your breathing tubes actually close completely. And for a brief period of time, you're not, you're not breathing. Now, you know, your body can sort of compensate when you're sleeping at nighttime you cannot breathe for five or 10 seconds, no problem. But in patients who have sleep apnea, they're sometimes not breathing for longer than that. And what happens then is because they're not breathing, their oxygen levels, they drop, they drop, they drop to a certain level that all of a sudden their, their mind and their brain says, wait a second, start breathing because your oxygen levels are dropping and then you'll start mm -hmm. breathing again. And so there's periods where you might not be breathing and there's periods where you're breathing again. And sometimes those periods when your brain is telling you to breathe, breathe again, they can make someone wake up with difficulty breathing or they can mm -hmm. feel like they're choking and gasping for air mm -hmm. or someone else who's watching them like a partner or a wife or a husband can say, I was seeing you breathing when you were taking a nap or sleeping. And there are periods where you weren't breathing normally. You would take a pause mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden you start breathing again. Those are classic findings that someone might actually have sleep apnea. And during those periods when the oxygen levels are actually dropping and going up and down, you can imagine how, there's periods of time that our body, uh, our brain is not getting all the oxygen that it needs. And that's why, because you're, you're, you're stopping breathing and, and your brain's saying, wake up, wake up, you're stopping breathing and your brain is saying, wake up, wake up. When patients, even if they might sleep for six or seven, eight hours, when they wake up in the morning, they'll say, I don't feel rested. And that's yeah. because their brain has been on the whole, on the whole night, trying to yeah. make sure that they're still breathing when they, and it can't relax. And so it's, ty it's typical for patients to not just when they wake up, they're not, they don't feel fresh. They're very, very sleepy. They have to sometimes take a nap during the day as well. And sometimes it can be quite sleepy and be quite dangerous because especially if you're driving a car or a vehicle, it yeah. can put you at risk of, uh, you know, falling asleep on the wheel and getting into a car accident. Um, so, for, you know, for all these reasons, it's quite important to sort of, one, recognize what the symptoms are of sleep apnea. And then two, you know, diagnose it, which typically is with like a sleep study. You'd go in, you'd sleep. Uh, in a lab and then a couple of weeks later someone will speak with you about the results and see if you have it or not and then discuss you know sort of how to treat it 
That, that sounds terrifying. I mean, you know, seeing your partner, your your family member kind of gasping for air and um, and all of that. So what I'm hearing is uh, get it checked if you are snoring loudly, if you are gasping for air and if you're waking up very tired. Anything else we should look out for? No, that would probably be the most biggest things that we look out for. So patients normally come either because they're snoring or like you yeah. said, having some of these symptoms at night are very tired. And usually if it's not so much the individuals who come themselves because they might say that I sleep throughout the whole night uh, yeah. and I have no problem sleeping. It's usually the partner, the husband or the wife who says, you know, and one of the common signs is, is that actually people will start sleeping in separate rooms because the oh, snoring God. is so disrupting that uh, they'll tell you actually, yeah, you know, we haven't slept for the same you know, for the past one year, a couple of years, because snoring is too loud. It's too and we're not even fighting. So <laughs> yes, exactly. Right. So the, the, the answer there is not to necessarily separate each other from sleeping in yeah. the same room, but, you know, actually go and get tested and get diagnosed. And that's what right. I would encourage everyone to do if they think they or a loved one might actually have sleep apnea, because there are very good effective therapies and treatments that don't necessarily uh, require medicines um, and it can make a big difference. And we have patients and individuals who also are very tired and sleep in the, or they can't concentrate during the day. And then mm -hmm. when we do treat the sleep apnea, they'll, they'll, they'll actually have an improvement in how they're thinking, in their cognition, uh, and how energetic they feel. And they'll realize, oh, this is what normal is supposed to feel like. Yes. I'm not just yeah. you know, tired from having a long day at work or tired because yeah. I, you know, I ate too much or something like that. It's actually because I have a medical condition that now is being treated. I've had patients that tell me my life has changed. They tell me like it, it, it almost feels like you've quit smoking almost because like your lungs feel better. Your, your energy is there. It's, it's, uh, it's quite life changing when you stick to taking to, to being on your CPAP machine and people, I mean, we see it on, we see it on TV and movies and, and, and series. Um, we see these like large CPAP machines that are this size and they're taking up the whole head so can you tell us a little bit about what's out there so people don't get discouraged? I know that, uh, you know, medical advances are a little bit better than, than what we're seeing on TV. And, uh, you know, people should not be discouraged about getting a sleep study because of this large, loud machine that's going to be next to them. It's, it's not true. They usually are a little bit different. I'll, I'll let you uh, tell us a little bit more about the machines. Yes, most definitely. So uh, the basics of what we tell all our patients who have sleep apnea is number one, you know, if they are overweight, not everyone's overweight, but many people are. So if they are overweight, we tell them to have a healthy, balanced diet and exercise and lose weight because we have had patients when they've lost a significant amount of weight that the sleep apnea actually goes away and they can come off treatment. So that's something that's easier said than done, but it requires no medicines. It just requires a little bit of willpower. And some people need a bit more help and support from their family doctor and other experts and that help is readily available. We tell patients who avoid using sleeping pills. So don't use sleeping pills and, and things that can make you sleepy, uh, you know, alcohol and things like that. Don't uh, have caffeinated beverages like tea and coffee late at night just before you sleep because your mind will still be running uh, with the caffeine when you're trying to sleep. So these are all parts of, you know, what we call sleep hygiene. And then when it comes to all those things, besides that, if you still have significant sleep apnea, then you know, we will encourage them to, um, if it's severe, we'll say use something called a CPAP machine. Um, and some patients, if they have very mild sleep apnea, they may be able to get away with either you know, sleeping on the side as opposed to on their back, depending on what the sleep study shows. Or they may be able to get away with wearing a, a dental appliance like a mouth guard that can help mm -hmm. keep their upper airway open as well. But those things are not always comfortable or they're not always covered by insurance and they can cost you know, two or $3,000. Um, and they're not always perfectly effective or available for everyone. Uh, so if you have, you know, significant sleep apnea, the vast majority of patients, they do require a CPAP machine and um, they actually benefit. It's the most effective therapy available. So back in the day, you know, 20 or so years ago, it would be something that was like, you know, big mask that you'd wear over your nose and mouth. It might be loud. Mm -hmm. It might bother the partner in bed and things like that. And mm -hmm. technology has advanced so much, like you said. So now we've not just one mask for everyone. There's all these different kinds of masks of different materials. Some of them cover the mouth, some of them cover the nose, yeah, some of them cover both of them. And you know, every patient's a bit different in terms of the shape of their nose and the shape of their face. So the CPAP company, and there's so many different companies out there, they will work with you to try and find the right mask that fits you. If you're having issues with 
the mask leaking or with uh, the fit not being perfect or you don't like the sense of it, they can always adjust some settings in the machine and they can also adjust the mask itself to find something that's comfortable for you. The other thing is because technology is advanced, um, they've become a lot more quieter, a lot more smaller and compact. They don't take so much space anymore. People travel with them on the planes all the time. Um, and, and, and you should do that if you already have a CPAP machine, you should take it with you if you're going overseas and on your travels uh, as well. Um, and these things are now, for the vast majority of individuals, they're covered by the government, a, a significant percentage. And so it really reduces the cost because it has been actually quite effective in helping treating this condition that can cause so many different complications. Um, and so there are a lot more smaller now as well. You can get masks and things that just sit underneath your nose, for example, as opposed to being something really big. Um, you know, a lot of patients have claustrophobia or things like that. And so having something that's a little more slimmer and sleeker is helpful. The newer ones all, you know, they have like apps that you can connect to your phone with. You can see how, how well you're sleeping at nighttime. You can really see your oxygen levels and, and, and things like that. Uh, how many times you're stopping breathing at nighttime and how that's really improving. Uh, you know, all these things are now readily available and you can see these downloaded reports as well on your phones and you can send it to your, your, you know, your sleep doctor as well. So technology has advanced and made it much easier for patients to, you know, tolerate the, the machines and there's settings that can be tweaked to make it more comfortable as well. And um, it's not oxygen. You're just getting air that is pressurized that goes, uh, you know, into your lungs and hopes, helps keep this open. So it prevents it from collapsing. So people think, is it oxygen? Is it a drug? Is it a medicine? It's, it's just air that's just pressurized uh, and this, it just keeps open and that's it. Uh, so in that regard, it's very safe, very effective. And that's why, you know, many people know someone who has the, uh, um, sleep apnea or uses a CPAP machine and it's made a big difference to their, like you said, it's been life-saving and big difference to their breathing. Absolutely. Sounds great. So I'm hearing that they are smaller, quieter, and the masks are not that big. So if you do feel like you have an issue, then please do speak to your family doctor about it. It's a diagnosis we make very commonly and really does change people's lives. Um, another diagnosis that I want to talk to you about is, uh, is, is quite concerning, actually. And it's something that as an emergency doctor, I see uh, quite often, or at least I think, uh, I think about quite often, uh, pulmonary embolism or PE or blood clot in the lungs. Can you tell us about what it is, who gets it, how I can avoid having one? Yes, you're right. You know, Dr. Kasim, you know, we think about this all the time in the emergency department and even as lung doctors. So a pulmonary embolism or uh, a blood clot in the lung, uh, like you said, um, can happen to anyone really um, at any age. But typically it happens in individuals where, generally speaking, if you're a little bit older, uh, you're more likely to get it. And there's certain medical conditions and things that can put you at risk. So if you are someone who is not moving around that much, if you're immobile, either because you've had an injury and you've hurt your leg and you're not walking around as much, um, or uh, you've had some recent surgery and you're not walking around or being as active, or if you have other conditions that increase the risk of you having blood clots, like having cancer, for example. You know, these conditions can increase the risk of you having a blood clot. And other patients, you know, they just have a genetic problem. They have a blood clotting disorder where their blood cannot be as thin as it should be. And they just add a higher risk of having these blood clots. And these blood clots, typically, they start off in your, the veins in your legs. Um, and what happens is they can travel from the veins in your legs all the way up to your lungs. And because your lungs have lots and lots of different blood vessels, and some of them are very, very tiny, those clots can get clogged there. Think about a pipe that has a blockage and because mm -hmm. of that clot being there in the way, then blood can't flow through there. Mm -hmm. And when blood can't flow through your lungs, it can't go through your lungs and it can't go to your heart. And that can be quite life-threatening. You know, patients can die from having a blood clot in the lungs, um, uh, especially if the clots are quite significant. And that's why we try and make sure that individuals are always making sure that they're watching out for the symptoms that might um, uh, you know, indicate that they have a blood clot either in their legs or in their lungs. So you might notice that one leg is more swollen than the other leg. One leg is more painful than the other leg or more red or warm than the other leg. Because um, normally your legs should be, look and appear the same and feel the same. Especially if someone who hasn't been moving around much or traveling and, uh, and has been immobile or has other risk factors. And then when it comes to uh, blood clots in the lungs, typically patients will have 
you know, very quickly they'll have difficulty breathing. It's not something that goes on for years and years. It's something that comes on very quickly within hours or within a few days, typically. You can get sharp stabbing pains uh, in your chest. Um, and, you know, sometimes some patients, if it's quite significant, actually cough up some blood as well. And uh, typically, if you're having any difficulty breathing that's quite concerning to you, significant, the first thing you should do is actually go to the emergency department because they'll be able to do blood tests, do some CAT scans and CT scans and look at your lungs. And if they also think that you might have a blood clot and you might think that you have a blood clot, depending on your risk, they'll decide whether or not to do a, a lung scan. And on that scan, they'll decide and they'll see if there's a clot or not, and then they'll treat it accordingly, or they'll provide some reassurance to say, thankfully, there's no clot that we can see, so we don't have to worry too much. Absolutely, absolutely. So thanks for that information. But how can I avoid getting one, though? Um, how can and the average person kind of, I mean, I'm hoping that's not something people think about often, but now that we're mentioning it, uh, what, what are the ways where I can kind of ensure as best as possible I don't get a... I, go, I don't get a uh, blood clot in the lungs. Yeah, so um, based on the risk factors and based on some of the conditions that increase your risk of having um, a blood clot, we always tell patients to try and stay active. Uh, so if, for example, if you are sitting, especially nowadays during COVID, you're sitting at your desk, you're working from home a lot, um, and um, you know, might not be moving around as much, just being immobile uh, can mm -hmm. certainly increase your risk of having blood clots in the legs and then traveling up to your lungs. So making sure that when you're working, even from home, even if you're young and healthy, um, you know, taking regular breaks, you know, every 15 minutes or so, just like you, you should take a break from looking at screens. Same thing, use that opportunity to, you know, move your legs around or even when you're at your desk, um, use like peddlers or take regular walks and breaks. Make sure you're well hydrated so you have enough fluids in your system uh, to uh, allow for blood to keep on flowing. Um, if you're taking long flights, for example, right, make sure that you're taking advantage of, especially if you're traveling from, you know, Canada to, you know, Asia, some of those flights can be, you know, 10, 15 hours or even longer. Make sure that you're walking quite regularly around the flight, um, at, like, just like you might see other people do. That's why they're doing it, because they don't want to increase the chances of, of them having uh, blood clots. And then if you are at increased risk, sometimes, you know, if you speak with your family doctor, they will say that um, there might be some medicines that you can take that can decrease your risk of having blood clots, especially if you've had them from before. Um, you know, other things that also increase your risk are smoking. Smoking increases your risk of you having blood clots. So quitting smoking is, again, another good reason why you should quit smoking. Um, and then, you know, especially for young women, you know, although it's, 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 it's not super common, but it can certainly happen if you're taking... Uh, you know, uh, hormonal therapy or both control pill in CAD and it slightly increase the risk of having blood clots. So again, having that discussion with your family and doctor about mm -hmm. the benefits and risks can be helpful and watching out for some of those, um, you know, symptoms. Same thing if you're going on a long drive, you know, if you're driving from, say, Toronto down to Florida and it's a long, you know, drive where we're staying in the car for six, eight, ten hours at a time, taking regular breaks and, and you know, making sure you're well hydrated and keeping your legs moving is is, is absolutely critical. Absolutely. Absolutely. No, thanks for that information. That's great. So, wow. So today we talked about quite a few topics uh, with our lung doctor, Dr. Hashim Khan. And uh, so we went through, what did we go through? We went through so many topics, we went through asthma, we went through COPD, we, we just went through uh, blood clots and, um, and we sleep learned apnea. so much together. Of course, sleep apnea, how could I forget? Um, we learned so much together. So I just wanted to thank you for taking the time with us today. Uh, I hope that this was uh, enjoyable for you as well, because I'm sure that our listeners are uh, are learning a lot. And I love that you put it in, in terms that uh, everyone can understand. So these common uh, medical terms that we hear uh, now make a little bit more sense. And so thank you for your time. And this was absolutely phenomenal. And we hope to have you back very, very soon. Thank you so much for having me, Dr. Kati. It was a pleasure being here. And I think it's really important that everyone sort of learns more about any lung conditions that they may have and whatever they can do to uh, help themselves and prevent things from getting worse. Um, and certainly if there's things that they can do to prevent their lungs from being worse 20, 30 years down the line, uh, then there's hopefully no regret later on as well. So inshallah, I think if everyone speaks to their family doctors and lung doctors, they, they're there to help and, and in any way that they can. Absolutely. Allah has blessed us with one body that we are renting uh, during this life. And uh, let's hope that we can treat it well. And uh, if we can, if we can impart one thing is please try to quit smoking. 
um, you'll, you'll, you'll thank yourself for it one day. Yes, most definitely. I, I, I could not agree more as a lung doctor. <laughs> All right. Sounds good. I hope you guys enjoy the rest of your weekend. Thanks for joining us today. And we'll see you next time at the Community Health Series. Assalamu alaikum. Take care. Assalamu alaikum.